Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's my great pleasure to, to welcome you here to King's College London, those of you who are from outside of the college. Um, my name's Denise Leavesley, and I'm head of the School of Social Science and Public Policy here at King's. And I think we're here today to celebrate the Department of Education and Professional Studies through the medium of their annual lecture. So I hope it will be a celebratory evening. We have an hour or so at our disposal, depending a bit on how lively the discussion is, and then there's going to be an opportunity for us to go upstairs and to have informal discussions over a drink. Let me, before I introduce the speaker, say just a few words about King's College, for those of you who do come from, from outside of the college. Um, this is a university which has a tradition spanning two centuries of bringing academic expertise and training to the service of society. And this meeting tonight is, of course, being hosted by the Department of Education and Professional Studies, which is part of the School of Social Science and Public Policy. Um, from September to the 1st, to be renamed the Faculty of Social Science and Public Policy. Our school's strengths are interdisciplinarity and bringing social science expertise to bear upon important policy issues internationally, nationally and locally. And colleagues use qualitative and quantitative information. They use theories and explanations together with norms and values to make sense of society. They also analyse how social science can be used both to understand and to shape our lives. And, of course, we strive for excellence in our teaching, a topic, I think, of great relevance to tonight's speaker. So let me turn to tonight's speaker, Dr Rowena, Rowena Arshad. She's head of the Moray House uh, School of Education and she's co-director of the Centre for Education for Racial Equality in Scotland at the University of Edinburgh. Rowena started her professional life in the private sector in business and banking, but I'm very pleased to say that she had a major career change and took a course in youth and community work in Reading. And in 1985, she moved to Edinburgh to work with the Scottish Education and Action for Development as an education and campaigns organiser. Then in 1988, she became director of the Multicultural Education Centre in Edinburgh and from there moved into Moray House. Rowena became the head of the Institute of Education, Community and Society in 2010 and from there she moved on to her current post as the head of the school in 2013. I think the first minority ethnic head of school of education in Scotland. Rowena co-directs the Centre for Education for Racial e Equality in Scotland. She was awarded an OBE in 2001 for services to racial equality. She has had many, many public appointments, but I'm going to mention just three. Um, she was Equal Opportunities Commissioner for Scotland. She sat on the Scottish Further and Higher Education Funding Council, so their equivalent of, of our HFC. And she is a member of, the, of Her Majesty's Inspectorate for Education, the Scottish Committee of Equality and Human Rights Commission, the Scottish Human Rights National Action Plan Advisory uh, Group, etc. So amazing, amazing number of, of appointments. What's really important is that she's passionate about multicultural and anti-racist education, both at school and tertiary levels. And she's passionate about teacher activism in areas of equity and anti-discrimination. But I think it's in particular her interest in teacher education and particularly its role in developing critical thinkers that she's the perfect choice for this year's annual education lecture here at King's. I always enjoy the annual education lecture and I know I'm going to tonight. So Rowena, pass over to you. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for that introduction. It was most kind. A few things here you've saved me saying and repeating, so that's great. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Sharon. I don't know about there, Sharon there. Um, Goetz for the invitation to come and share some thoughts with you. 
this evening on the subject of inclusion and diversity. I've long admired your work, so when you emailed or rang or wrote, I can't remember now, to say, would you come, I could not say no. I want to um, start by acknowledging everyone in this room who's actually worked over a period of time um, challenging discrimination, um, working to promote greater equality, whether that's via your teaching, um, your research, in terms of whether some of you might be in policy development, um, some of you have various roles you play within senior middle management, or as a teacher, as a student, as a parent, as a member of the community. I also suspect there are people in this room um, who would like to see greater change in the area of diversity and inclusion, moving more from rhetoric into reality. I do not intend this evening to present statistics or engage in deep sociological unpacking of theories. I think you do that probably on a day-to-day -day basis in your work already. And I'm not going to use PowerPoint. Rather, if you will allow me, I would like to draw from my observations and experiences, as you said, from the two decades and more of working in this field, but more particularly also from the role that I've had in the last year as head of school. There are three themes, I think, that I'd like to touch upon. The first is to actually, in conversation with you, have a, have a reflection about what progress we think we've made in the area of inclusion and diversity. The second relates to my current role, and I've called it here the importance of having formal authority. And the third is looking at the area of concepts and practice clarity, but looking in particular at everyday forms of discrimination. So to the first area then on progress, what kind of progress do you think we've made? Or more to the point, is the progress we've made still moving forward, albeit slow, the pace? Well, I've worked in the field since about 1985, and as Denise has already said, I moved to Scotland in 85 from Reading. When I came to Scotland, uh, class issues were by and large acknowledged, so people understood poverty issues in class. It didn't mean that a whole lot was done about it, but people acknowledged it. There was some recognition of gender issues, not a lot, some. Recognition of disability was largely confined to the charity model. We feel sorry for the person, so we try to help them. So it's a charity model. There was virtually no recognition of sexual orientation, flat denial, actually, of racism. And despite the fact that sectarianism between Catholics and Protestants were doorstep issues for some um, geographical areas, again, no one was really talking about it. Not openly, anyway. And to think about other forms of religious or faith um, discrimination, it's just not on the radar. And there was a, still a myth that the education system was a level playing field. We have in Scotland a term which is called lad or perts. Does anybody know what that is? Lad or perts. Has anybody heard that phrase? So lad of parts is a lad. Okay, not lass of parts, lad of parts. And basically what that means is, because Scotland has this view of itself as being highly egalitarian. Well, I suspect most countries in the world would like to see themselves in that way. So it's not unique. But in Scotland, it's perceived as being almost like by dint of being in your blood, you know. So this lad of parts was that Effectively, it doesn't matter if you come from a farming community or a poor community or wherever. If you've got the ability, you'll make it. And you'll, so if you can get into education, you'll make it if you've got the ability. It's a meritocratic model, essentially. And actually, led or parents were largely children from middle-class homes. So you didn't see many lads from rural areas. And you certainly didn't see many lasses either. I would suggest in 2014, that within the education sector, there is greater understanding of how issues of power and social context, institutional factors, can in fact create situations where education establishments do not necessarily reward or provide equality of opportunity to all learners. This is not to say that as teachers, as lecturers, that we're not aware of inequality issues. On the contrary, many of us, many of you in this room, in fact, 
um, campaign very hard for the child's right to learn, for pupils to be safe at school, for learners to have greater access to further and higher education. And the hopes and aspirations uh, for equality and inclusion are kept alive by people like yourselves, by this collective action that we engage in. So I think we are more aware that if we're serious about getting it right for every child, that we need to include the child, the holistic version, the whole child, the, the home, the context, the community the child is living in. We're also, I think, much more afraid with legislation, so we are using terms like making reasonable adjustments. Um, in some instances, we have even learned to adapt practice and attitudes in light of the diversities of people we now come across. So back at the School of Education, just like many of you here, we draw on a range of writers and theorists, and we get our students to think about terms like habitus and reproduction and hegemony, institutional structural discrimination. We help them unpack dimensions of power and so on. And we actually ask our students to consider the central role that schools have in either reproduction um, of cultural and social inequalities, or in fact, as sites for disrupting norms. We also, I think, move our students into human agency, change agency, and activism, helping them or helping to work with them for transformative education. So we are hopefully producing teachers of tomorrow who will question rather than have an inclination to believe and who will not just be carriers of conservative knowledge handed down from generation to generation uncritically. The concern I have, certainly within my school, is that this approach is not shared across the school. Therefore, student teachers will have exposure to these issues, but it's still largely piecemeal, and dependent on the individual staff awareness, confidence, and enthusiasm for these issues. And so there are certain subject areas English, English literature being an example, which lends itself and does in fact promote this um, inclusion and inclusive pedagogy, but it's not embedded across all we do. I think there's still a divide where some teacher educators see their role as imparting skills and techniques to student teachers so that they can be efficient, effective teachers. So it's an emphasis on the technical rather than the critical epistemological aspects of teaching. I even hear within my own school very recently colleagues suggesting there's too much going on in the social justice and sustainability malarkey. We really need solid, good teaching. In an increasingly diverse society where there are different people, perspectives, and ways of seeing and knowing, conservative approaches will just not be relevant. Therefore, any taken for grantedness requires to be re examined. So, my question again. Is progress still moving forward, or are we at a standstill? Or worse still, have we regressed? I suspect depending on who you are and your context, the answers will be different. The British Attitude Survey undertaken in 2013 and recently published found that there are differences depending on the equality issue you are looking at. They found that the proportion of British people who now admit to being racially prejudiced and this includes prejudice against a range of people, including Muslims and Islamophobia, has risen since the millennium. Now, peaks occur linked to global and local issues. 9-11, the murder of Lee Rigby, the war in Iraq, causes a peak. But other world events, such as the Olympics, giving us a good, a good field factor, shows that, in fact, there is a rise of tolerance, if you take the research at that point. But what for me is interesting is that on the matter of race, the percentage prepared to say they're racially prejudiced has gone up. Now, perhaps it's an indicator that people are more prepared to be honest, and surely that's a good thing. However, perhaps it's also that people feel it's now OK to actually admit this under the banner of freedom of speech. I'll come back to this point again later in my talk. This is in stark contrast to the same attitude survey that found that views on same-sex marriage and sex before marriage, in fact, people are now showing themselves to be more tolerant and liberal. So depending on which equality issue you're looking at, I think progress 
for some things might in fact be going forward and in other things coming to a standstill or worse still, regressing. And I would certainly, at the end of this, be interested in your own views and your own perceptions of whether you think things are improving. The issue I'm most steeped in, and you will have gathered that from the introduction, is that of race equality. For me, race is the prism from which I analyse events and issues. So the issue of race is never too far away from my consciousness. I am also acutely aware of gender, particularly in the area of pay inequality. My partner is disabled, so I have a vested interest in issues of disability. And age, well, as a personal level, as the years go on, I definitely have a vested interest in that too. However, it is race that has had the most palpable impact on me since I came to Britain in 1977. From being name-called on the street to being spat at, numerous times being told to go home to where I come from, and the most recent occurrence only a few weeks ago on the High Street of Edinburgh. And as a family having undergone racial harassment, I used to wonder why the wind used to circulate in my street and dump the rubbish in my garden, nobody else's. Well, funny wind it was. My view is that on race, certainly from a Scottish perspective, and I can only speak from there because that's where I've lived for the last almost 30 years, well, 25 years, that it's no longer cool to talk about race-related issues. I think the election of Barack Obama was a turning point which led many to claim that we're now living in a post-racial era. In education, and certainly in Scotland, I get a feel that, that we have done race. We have all the multicultural celebrations, and in general, we get on really well, so there is no issue. Yes, space has been created for diversities, opinions have evolved, there's more integration, but racial harmony is no indicator of racial justice. And that is a point that is so difficult to get across to many of the people that I work with, my friends, and to education policy makers. In a study my colleagues and I conducted in 2005 involving 96 black minority ethnic pupils, 82 teachers, mainly white, overwhelmingly so, and 36 parents of the 96 pupils, we found there was considerable variation in what black minority ethnic pupils and parents were saying about racism and race equality in comparison to the teachers. Parents and pupils wanted schools to engage much more in social issues and discussions about harassment and lived experiences. Teachers, on the other hand, thought they were doing actually as much as they could or actually doing quite well. In a more recent study in 2011, a collaboration with my colleagues in Manchester Metropolitan University with Peter Hicks and Lorna Roberts, we interviewed 31 teacher educators in both our institutions. And we found, again, lecturer awareness. So these are colleagues who span the whole spectrum, PGDE, um, undergraduate, because we do undergraduate, and across different subject areas. We found that the awareness and confidence varied significantly. And whilst there was a strong consensus that it was important to embed issues of equality, including race equality, because these issues were seen to be complex and difficult, by and large, people left them to someone else to do it, though they would themselves say they were definitely not opposed to it. They, they, in fact, they, they wanted to encourage more discussion about these issues, but they left it to somebody else to do it. Some of the interviewees that we found also preferred to focus on other terminologies such as culture. It's a more comfortable concept than talking about racial discrimination or racism. Some were completely oblivious that racial discrimination was occurring and that pupils in the school might be facing racism in the streets or in the communities. In the same way that they were equally oblivious that some of the perpetrators were the pupils in the school. What's interesting is they're currently doing a project um, with colleagues at St. Andrews University in Newcastle. It's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. It's a three-year project, and the title is The Everyday Geopolitics of Minority Ethnic um, Young People Aged 12 to 25 in Scotland. And so we're interested in the lived experience on a day-to-day -day basis and how local national events might impact on the lives of these young people. And this week, we've just done a spate of interviews in schools. 
And the good news for those of you who work with teachers uh, or who are teachers yourself is that in general, young people find schools a safe place to be. So there's a lot of, I think, progress and you know, big takes here that schools are places that young people feel if racism was to happen, in general, it'd get picked up on and it'd get dealt with, as with probably other equality issues. But they did talk a lot about what they faced the minute they left the school gates. Now, the question for us is that if the teachers don't know that, then how are they going to build that into their consciousness when they work with their students and their pupils? So whilst there is progress, it is patchy, and it's dependent on the issue, so it's a bit of a lottery still. The purpose of asking us this evening to consider the issue of progress is to remind us, because I'm well aware that this is an audience of an interested group of people, to not take our foot off the accelerator, because I think we have to keep that pressure on. I now want to move into looking at this importance of the formal authority. Murray House School of Education dates back over 200 years. The current school has evolved from several mergers, and it merged with the University of Edinburgh in 1998. It is one of the largest schools in the university, with about 250 full-time academic and support staff and 100 seconded contracted teaching staff. We have over 3,000 students covering undergraduate, postgraduate taught, postgraduate research. I never expected to get the role of it's interesting, I keep flipping between these two terms, dean and head of school, because within Scottish education, the term is dean, but within the University of Edinburgh, the term is head of school. So it, we, I, didn't, I didn't expect to get the post. Uh, we appoint through open competition, and the post is for three years with an extension of two years if you don't block your copybook. So I'm hoping I don't block my copybook. I am in a strange position of being a black minority ethnic woman heading up an almost all-white staff team. At the start, I mulled over how I would actually portray myself, trying to be careful not to wear my equality, anti-racist hat or credentials because of fear of being labeled or somebody who always goes on about these issues or somebody who's using their position as head of school to promote particular issues. So for the first few weeks, I played down all these aspects of who I am. Now, at the point of starting the post, the press get interested. So, you know, I had Times Ed and people like that wanting to come and do interviews. So I was giving them interviews. And it was at the end of one of those interviews, as the reporter was packing up her tape recorder, I happened to say to her, do you think I've spoken a bit much, do you think, about equality issues and race issues? And her reply was a turning point for me. She said, and I paraphrase, people will expect you to talk about these issues. And if you do not, they will think there is something wrong. Besides, if you do not take this opportunity to talk about the issues that you're passionate about, then you may not have another opportunity. The reporter did not know how important her words were because it gave me the confidence to speak up unapologetically about these issues since then and to take opportunities to place them on the agenda. If I'm going to be stereotyped as that diversity person, then I'm just going to do a jolly good job of being that diversity person. I now have formal authority to make things happen, and this has taken some getting used to. However, the issue of having formal authority to make things happen is, I think, very important. Up till now, I could still make things happen, but often through persuasion and clever strategizing. Now I can ask for change to take place, put resources to enable this to happen, and set in place support structures to assist others to do the same. When I took over, I started tweeting work as well as issues of interest to me personally. I tweet most days, and the tweets are largely about social issues. So today, for example, I tweeted something about the impact of uh, potentially post-referendum independence on higher education in Scotland. Then there are the tweets that congratulate staff and students about how well they've done and this and that. But I also tweet about things like the survey that I talked about earlier, where it's showing Britain is not becoming more tolerant, possibly even more racist. And I tweet about how I think Scotland needs to be careful about its own complacency on these issues. What's interesting for me is who's retweeting these tweets. My boss, 
is one of them. That's a good sign. I was asked in October 2013 to provide the inaugural lecture for the University of Edinburgh's first Black History Month. We're so behind. We only just caught up last year. After the lecture, several black minority ethnic students from across the university came to tell me about subtle and sometimes overt racism they were experiencing. So these weren't just people in humanities and social science. These were people from science and engineering, from medicine and vet med across the whole university. And they largely felt no one was listening to them. They would report incidents, but nothing really happened. So I worked with Edinburgh University Student Association to collate these experiences because on their own, these individual stories were just that. They were individual stories. So all the researchers in the room here will know that actually, if you put them all together, they become circumstantial evidence of something, of a culture that tolerates this sort of behavior and uh, levels of um, racism. I shared these findings at University Senate earlier this um, year. And this is why formal position, formal authority is important, because I wouldn't have been at that Senate in that position to be able to share it if I wasn't a head of school, but also choosing to do that. I then arranged for a group of the students to meet with the vice principal responsible for equality and diversity to get action for race equality on campus. Now, we're taking part, to part in an equality challenge unit pilot to look at a race equality charter mark for the university. Now, I know some people are cynical about charter marks and badges and all that, but having worked through to get a bronze, uh, uh, to put forward an application for bronze gender equality for our sports science colleagues, what I think it does is it stimulates discussions. It'd be nice to get the badge and the charter mark, but actually it's the stimulating discussions in the workplace and getting institutional practices reviewed that are the real gains. So I'm looking forward to this in the coming year. I've noticed within my school, my own school, that black minority ethnic students are coming forward with their own stories of othering and also advice to me about how we might improve. Within one year, I have seen more doctoral applications, student applications coming in to study the area of race equality from across the world and related issues looking at a range of topics from schooling to the experiences of Muslim academics and higher education. And because I am now far more familiar with the system, I've been able to assist two students get studentships um, so that they can study with the research centre that Denise talked about earlier. I've also placed on the agenda issues of internationalising the campus. We recruit a large number of international students. Almost all our postgraduate students are international. And although diversity is very present because you can see it, it's less certain, actually, how we're meeting the needs of this diverse group of students. And also the impact that it's having on home students. I did my first graduation last um, November, and those of you who've done the graduation and read out loads of names will identify with this. They were entirely a cohort, almost, of Chinese students. So learning the names the night before was really important. At the end of the ceremony, one member of staff came up to me and said, ah, so that's how you pronounce the student's name. Do you know I've been calling her something completely different all year? And I thought, now, OK, this member of staff's not meaning to be uncaring, but she could not understand why the student didn't just correct her pronunciation. Now, there are intercultural communication issues here. There's also potentially a breakdown of understanding of the relationship between student status of student and teacher. I thought we were past the stage of naivety, but clearly not. So I have initiated a series of seminars on campus looking at internationalizing our campus, asking us questions like, how can we assist home students to benefit from studying in that international campus? Our students do not think of themselves as international or cosmopolitan. In Scotland, we have an appalling record of students going to Europe to study or other parts of the world. We very much stay at home pigeons in that sense. How can we provide forums for staff to engage? How can we think about internationalizing the curriculum undergraduate as well as postgraduate? In addition, I've commissioned a small piece of work from one of the international students who are our recent graduate to gather the views of students in the school about how well we're doing in the area of internationalizing the campus, where we can improve, and also the good news stories that will feed back at this seminar. 
Now, I have been able to do all of this because of that formal authority and power as head of school. This is not to say I could not have organized a similar se series of seminars, but I would have had to convince my colleagues, and I would have had to find the budget and so on. We're now also working with doctoral students to put in seminars routinely on things like anti-racist or critical um, uh, anti-discriminatory research methodology, using critical race theory, queer theory, whatever, the different theories, discussing theories of silence, intersectionality, and this is now available to all our doctoral students. It's also about having the power to create the international memorandums of understanding that you want. Edinburgh University, or my principal and, and the entourage, are very shortly, if not already there, heading to Toronto to sign a deal or a memorandum of understanding with Toronto University. And it's all big splashes on our kind of homepage. And I looked down the list and I thought, where's education? In fact, where's social justice? Where's all these things that we're so good at? And we already work with our colleagues in the Ontario Institute of Education on this. It wasn't there. So I rang them up, or emailed them rather, and said, where's education? And they said, ah, yes, uh -huh. it's not on the list. But you know, this is only the beginning of the journey. You, there's opportunities. Look, there's a bit here that says addendum. And I said, well, it's very nice to be include, invited to be an addendum, but it'd be really nice if we were at, in the middle right now when you're signing it in um, Toronto in a few weeks. So it is now there. School of Education, as well as social justice and race equality, is actually named as an area of potential collaboration. And that's because, again, it's possible from where I'm sitting. I've been able to put forward the name of someone who's a woman. I can't name them yet because it's always secret, these things. Woman, international, not from the West, from minority ethnic background for an honorary doctorate of education within the school. And I think this is the first time that this has happened with somebody who's not white has received an honorary doctorate from the school. More importantly, I now sit on promotions committees and can ensure that those who are underrepresented, young lecturers, young women lecturers, um, young minority ethnic lecturers, can get the necessary mentoring and support to move them upwards. I'm also largely involved in recruitment and selection panels for all the lectureships in the school, and are now able to influence the way applicant experience is viewed, so that equivalencies are looked at. I can also ensure who sits on these panels. And I make sure that there are people all the time who have an interest in social justice issues. Gloria Latson Billings, um, an educator in the States, professor in the States, wrote an article a few years ago titled, Is the Team All Right? Well, I think what I'm trying to do is to start maneuvering for the team to be all right. Now, you might be thinking, but surely any head of school at Edinburgh could have achieved all the above. Yes, I think so. But you need to ask the question, why has it not happened before? The danger, of course, is that people will have unrealistic expectations. I've set myself the task of being a transformational agent. It's a tough one to set yourself that task. There are rewards of being able to do these things. However, like many in the room here who have set themselves that kind of role as well, you can get caught up in institutional and cultural norms that act as barriers. Sharon, when you wrote a paper in 2006, you said, if we are to enact justice, then we must be aware of the mediated nature of just practice. So that is what I'm now finding, that whilst I have all these aspirations, things come into play that actually act like blocks. So yesterday, I spent time with a young lecturer um, who is putting together, a, it's actually at the final stages of putting together an MSc um, on social justice totally online, so it's a distance education initiative. And I had to speak to her because under current projections, we're not sure that this particular program is going to attract enough mem you know, um, students to come on it to make it run. And therefore, I have to set a minimum number um, of student numbers before we can run it. Because at the present, it looks as though it might be making us a 50,000 pound deficit year on year and it will be accumulated. However, this member of staff felt 
that given my own background, that I should just allow the programme to commence, regardless of the numbers signing up for the programme, and was disappointed and disillusioned that I did not just agree to do this. Now, if the school was financially bursting with cash, then it would not be a problem. But we do not have excess cash, and therefore I have to balance supporting this young member of staff and their passion for an area that I too am passionate in against the fact that it's going to make a potentially a big financial loss for the school. So Sharon's paper talked about having to work with other norms that might not be concerned with justice, and in this instance, financial and economic norms. I return after the weekend to speak with her on Monday to see whether we can find a pathway through, because I want to make this happen, but I also need to know what the risk is for the school. Moving on to the last bit then, conceptual practice issues. I have to say I find the terms, and I don't know if you do, but I do, find the terms inclusion and diversity to be problematic. Both terms are ones you would not disagree with, but they are somewhat fluffy and ambiguous. Inclusion into what? A framework that potentially doesn't recognise you? What diversities are we actually talking about? Are we talking about all diversities, or only the ones we're comfortable to work with? As I always say to my students, how can we include when we do not know how we currently exclude? So we need to actually provide spaces for people to talk honestly about how exclusion might occur. And this will vary, as we said from the beginning, for different individuals and different groups. But I do think it's important to name the ways exclusion are occurring and to help student teachers navigate that terrain of complexities and potential pitfalls. In 2014, I would hope most of us would not tolerate overt forms of discrimination or exclusionary practices. However, unless you're on the receiving end of the subtle forms of exclusion, you're unlikely to know it's occurring. So you've got to ask people and get them talking. This subtle low levels forms of exclusion, and for those of you who were at the series conference last year listening to Philomena Essert, I do apologize, but I'm going to draw from her work. Philomena Essert, a professor of critical race, gender, and leadership studies at Antioch University in the States, she coined this term 20 years ago, everyday racism. Now, you can replace that word racism with otherism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, classism, discrimination. What the concept that she's trying to get through is that these everyday forms, these subtle forms, um, is really what we now need to be concentrating on. So we need to adjust our thinking. Instead of saying that people are oversensitive, why don't we concentrate about and look at why we're always indifferent? That's a different way of looking at it. So it's not about people being oversensitive. What about our indifference to a lot of diversities and issues? My own research talking with black minority ethnic students in university earlier this year, and also young people on everyday forms of discrimination, such as gender discrimination, is we know it's very much alive. However, for most people, they're resigned to it, and so they don't actually complain. They don't often talk about it either. I said I was uh, working earlier with this group of black students to raise the issue of how racism is occurring on the campus. And one of the students told me they had reported incidents to the tutor, who was very sympathetic. When the students suggested they wished, however, to move on to a formal complaint, the tutor responded by saying, you really need to think about the feelings of the perpetrator as well, and all the stress that you're going to be putting each other through. So everyday forms of discrimination does not mean that we're surrounded by bigots. Everyday forms of discrimination more than often occurs with no intent. It is unnoticed, it is not orchestrated, but becomes, what, as what Antonio Gramsci would call, the hegemony of where we are. The taken for granted is, is just the way things are, like the air we breathe. I suggest at an institutional level, and also at the practitioner level, we need to become far more aware of not just the overt, because I think we know that, but the seemingly small, meaningless ways that exclusion can occur. We need to adjust our radars so that we are more aware of picking up those micro ways that we can exclude, marginalize, negate, make invisible, misrecognize, often in ways that are difficult to pinpoint. Individually, these events do not seem to be important, but in accumulation, the social, economic, and emotional burden can become chronic and can result in physical and other health hazards. 
the accumulation of low-level forms of exclusion causes stress, can damage careers, and definitely impacts on self-esteem. Everyday discrimination can be experienced as routine rejections, whether that's via the formal curriculum, you're just not seeing yourself in the curriculum, or hidden curriculum by the ethos of where you are. I mean, you'll know that feeling. You'll know that there are certain places, for whatever reasons, you don't go to at certain times of the day or whatever, certain pubs that you might not want to partake in. You know, because you get vibes of not welcome, not for you. That's what I mean. It's that kind of everyday forms of things. You know it from social interactions, through rules and regulations that just do not recognize. It can lead those on the receiving end to internalize that rejection or misrecognition, resulting in loss of dignity, place, and confidence. Often those on the receiving end cannot explain what is going on either, and self-doubt starts to appear. You start to blame yourself. Or you start to try and do better and better to prove your worth. Rules are also applied differently. I want to give you an example. In our doctoral student area and postgraduate area, there's a fridge. It's a kitchen and fridge, and it's shared alongside an office where the staff work in it. And food kept going missing from this fridge. So notices got put up, please don't take the food and all that kind of stuff. Fair enough. But one day there was this black student, international student, that was there. And she was asked up front, do you take the food? Did you take the food? This student got picked out. And, and, and I have to say, did this student get picked out because she was more easily identifiable because of how she looked? Why were others not asked the same question? Is it because subliminally there was an assumption, maybe, that black international students might not understand local conventions? And by the same token, that home students and others did understand conventions about don't take other people's food from the fridge? I do not know the answers to any of this. But if we're committed to inclusive practice, then we must interrogate all possibilities and not simply dismiss this as, some, as something that is a piece of nonsense. Failure to recognize how exclusion can occur, whether at individual, cultural, institutional level, often results in those on the receiving end beginning to anticipate things might happen. It can lead to disillusionment, silences, and suspicions, whether warranted or not. This is systemic. Philomena Acid at a conference uh, that I referred to actually also introduced us to another concept which she's currently working on, and she called it entitlement racism. She said she was developing this. And again, um, you can replace that with entitlement sexism, entitlement classism, whatever ism you wish to add. Now, you will all remember this, where people used to say things like, I'm not racist, and you knew there was a but coming. Somewhere in there, there was a but. And you kind of know, yeah, right, you're going to go down a pathway that's just going to prove the first bit of your sentence is inaccurate. But at least they were apologetic about it, and they said, I'm not racist, but. But what Philomena Asset is saying is that now people don't even apologize. There is a boldness. And the narrative now is that I have a right to say this. It's my right. So discriminatory attitudes are legitimized under a rights umbrella the right to freedom of speech. It is a belief that you can express yourself in whatever way you feel like, and it's okay to offend. And that is what she means by entitlement racism. And the problem is that if we are silent, we might not agree, but we become complicit in it. However, I think alongside this right to offend kind of narrative, it's what explains it away. It's that one bad apple, it's a personality issue. Um, I hear it in my workplace. Ugh, you know what she's like or what he's like, or no emotional intelligence. It's just the way they speak. That is a way of legitimizing these indiscretions as though they were personal things. And that, I think, is actually quite dangerous. Gary Young, Guardian journalist, talks about 21st century forms of discrimination as something that is subtle and amounts to continued institutional and marginalization of groups performed with the utmost discretion and minimum of fuss by well-mannered and often well-intentioned people. 
guess people like us. So, what next then? Well, I think the first is to hold on to what we've always said, that education is not a neutral exercise. It is not simply a search for more effective transmission. It's not just about making learning relevant by taking into account the experiences of the young people or the students we work with. I think it is about giving voice and recognition. That's really important. Finding ways to enable people to be at the table in the discussion, in the power sharing. And if you can even give power, formal authority to pupils and learners, I think that's a step forward. Those in power positions in this room, people like myself and others in this room, we need to be constantly, consistently vigilant for opportunities to enable transformation, to provide the spaces for debate, to ensure the right people are at the right jobs and roles, to continue to ask difficult questions, to not let people get away or slide away from their responsibilities uh, with excuses or avoidance tactics, to continuously lead by example and to give a clear message you intend to have the right team on the playing field. And if they're not the right, they're not on the playing field. In the book I co-edited with my colleagues Terry Wrigley and Lynn Pratt, our conclusion chapter started with the sentence, teaching is a profession of hope. It involves the formation of each new generation into the citizens of tomorrow for a world that we do not yet know. We do not know what the future will look like, but one thing we do know is what happens in our classrooms and in our lecture theatres and in our workshop rooms will shape that tomorrow. Teacher educators are important contributors in helping to achieve greater inclusion and justice in the world. We don't have to be superheroes to make a difference. If you ever doubt the impact you can make, then reflect on this famous African proverb, which I'm sure most of you have heard. If you think you are too small to make a difference, try to sleep in a closed room with a mosquito. Thank you. Thank you, Rowena, um, for the thing, inspiring. Uh, colleagues, um, we've got a couple of minutes. You've got any questions, observations, comments? A point to go ahead. absolutely agree with you on that. I mean, one of the things, that, and you won't know this because this is very much a Scottish thing, and it's good in one sense, but not so, uh, uh, is this law or this act called the Additional Support for Learning Act. Have people heard about the Additional Support for Learning Act? Have, have you heard that with yourself? Well, that's a whole lot of issues. All, I know, all we know is at the moment, we're disabled students access to mainstream education. Yeah. And this is like what I don't know, is there is attacks at school, verbal education, the children's family, that. And now we've got the tax on the disabled students. So it's a tax everywhere in terms of promoting our inclusion. 
but the additional support for learning act is actually problematic because I think for two things it's it, it, the aspiration is good but what it is it's trying to say every one of us has an additional need for learning so whether that is uh, whatever you know whether it's um, critical literacy or academic writing or whatever all of us but what it doesn't do is speak the language of disability rights and that is where it starts the, you know fudging the issue but the other thing it does is it focuses on the individual it doesn't look at the macro issues and therefore if the individual having been given all this help then doesn't take it up because either it doesn't suit them because that's never what they wanted in the first place or they just don't take it up they're seen then as ungrateful for it and i think that's why the focus on individuals without the meso and the macro is really really dangerous so this thing i think michael gove very recently in his policy exchange talk earlier last week or something like that talked about schools um, needing to actually that what is it, is it poverty it's not destiny or something like that in, in other words how where you're born should not be where you necessarily land up but he's talking in a void he's not actually looking at the structural pressures that are being put on the system that actually means that you can't um, get it right for every child so i think it chimes a wee bit with what you're saying there but for me it's that avoidance of talking about issues of rights and consistently talking about issues and needs and doing protective channeling on top of that so thank you for that thank you um, any other oh go ahead You think that's the case here too? I was talking about Scot that's the Scottish experience. You I think, think here as well? I think the sector widely, rather than just here at King's. I think the sector widely. But I'm talking about England, yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that the, the Charter Mark will provide um, a way of trying to re-energise the work around race. Well, it'd be very interesting to actually keep in touch, actually, to see how we're getting on um, and support each other in terms of institutional networks. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, my uh, sense is there's a difference in attention when you're a reader as I am, you know, a thousand plus people, is between literally economic mm -hmm. and policy. And we talked about in the survey, we did not have, but the, you know, the government in the last month, 200, we had to find 340,000 dollars of customers. Um, yes, I don't know the full answer to that. I'm starting in my second year to start. I think you're talking a slightly different situation where you're talking about a governmental pressure. I'm talking here sometimes about institutional from the university's um, mission statements and what they want to see. So um, I haven't, for example, appointed certain professor uh, vacant chairs because I can't afford to appoint vacant chairs because they cost me a lot of money. Um, I've also made very clear statements that I am not interested in, and I, I do apologise, this does sound incredibly ageist and, and rude here, but I don't mean it like that, that I'm not going to appoint people who are using University of Edinburgh as the last stop before they retire, because I need to have readers coming in at a much lower salary, but I know they will give me a lot of mileage for it. Um, these are unpopular because professorial colleagues are going, mm, excuse me, why are you doing this? And the reason I'm doing this is I know that I need a teaching fellow or two teaching fellows because I need to put them in front of um, the students. So I'm making these kinds of unpopular decisions. But then, of course, I'm not talking about going against governmental policy. I'm going against potentially my own university. And so I will push back. And the reason, if, 
if, if I don't push back, is that I will start losing staff um, support. And I know at the end of the day, that's very important to me, that staff and, 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 the, and the students um, see me as somebody that will have some integrity in this area. It is tough. I, mean, I gave the example of having to go back on Monday and saying to the student, that particular lecturer, I may not be able to let your programme go forward. Uh, we have workload issues. Our staff are way over workload, and I don't know what to do about it because I don't have the money to employ more staff. So I know what you're saying here. You're talking about service delivery. I'm talking about staffing delivery. Uh, it's tough. But at some point, pushback is required. I think you need to know where your bottom line is. I'm still finding mine as well. So, and confidence. I've come to the conclusion, the age I am, that if they were going to take me out of the system and sack me, it would take a good few years. And by then, I am wanting to go anyway. So <laughs> it, it, it is a privilege that comes with getting older, having that confidence. Um, C'est la vie. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, I think uh, <laughs> uh, it just leaves me to say a word of appreciation. Uh, thank you very much for uh, a very, very interesting and inspiring talk. It just occurs to me, you audio tape this, don't you tape this? This is all going to be there for my bosses to hear now, but never mind. <laughs> we'll, we'll do a bit of editing, no worries. Uh, I particularly uh, uh, found the if you like, the accounts of your personal position in working in an institution as uh, a person of color, um, interesting. I think your experiences uh, illustrate something that's endemic in our system at the moment. I'm referring to England now, I guess. In the kind of um, liberal pluralism that we have, I think the assumption is uh, all the hindrances and obstacles, and in other words, racism, whatever, uh, have been removed. So therefore, it's really up, up to us to work within the legal, moral framework in society to make our own way. In other words, where you're born is not your destination and so on. But in fact, I think there's a huge tension between that space where we are meant to be free to operate. The moment we cross over into any sign of showing any interest in protecting anything to do with the group-based rights and uh, opportunities, then suddenly it becomes very tricky. And if anything, I mean, the, whatever the rights and wrongs of the current situation in the Birmingham schools may be, the bigger piece is society finds it very difficult to tolerate anything remotely to do with group-based rights and any attempt to sort of say, well, here's a group of people who may want to develop something alternative as their community uh, a norm and so on. So we're constantly having to work in that area, and I think your personal experiences um, illustrate that tension very well, and I suspect very many of us actually uh, find that a daily struggle too here from whatever perspective, whether we are of color or white. So. So in a way, the, the, the inspiring thing is uh, we're all here, and we understand the, the message, and uh, we'll uh, carry on with the, the work. Um, international university, international educator, and all the rest of it. So thank you very much. Thank you.